Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so glad that you could join us today on our monthly masterclass. So welcome, welcome. So first off, um, let me uh, introduce myself. My name is Allison Ubanic. And I am board certified in holistic nutrition, and I'm also a Amen Clinic's brain health professional. And just to give you a little bit of backstory about myself, um, I got here because both of my parents had Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it was really challenging for me as one of their primary caregivers. And honestly, I was like really concerned for my own brain health. And I just did not want, you know, my family to go through what I and my brother went through with our parents. Um, and so I really just started diving deep and really started investigating all kinds of anything I could get my hands on about brain health. I mean, I was anything I could learn. I learned so much, so many things that put us at risk, um, you know, so many things that I could be doing. And this piece that just kept really circling back around over and over again was how gut health is really the foundation of brain health. And without gut health, literally our brain is in jeopardy. And so that's where I really just started putting a lot of my own personal energy was into looking at all these gut pieces, right? Like what, what kind of nutrient deficiencies were really important? What were the things that really caused such an impact in the gut? You know, how did the gut and the brain really interact, right? And, you know, I'll be honest, at that time, you know, we're talking like 12 or 15 years ago, I really didn't even understand that like neurotransmitters were made in the GI tract. Like I thought all those things were in the brain and it was really eye-opening to me to see how much of the things that, you know, make our brain work actually come from the gut. So now really what I'm so passionate about is getting this piece out, you know, to really try to educate people about gut health and how it affects the brain, because we can make choices now that can decide our future. Or if we're already heading down an uh, area of where we're going to have some brain dysfunction, we can change it around. And, you know, that to me was completely eye-opening that I did not have to be destined on the same path as my parents, that I had choices I could make that could change that around. And so that's really what I'm passionate about. Um, so now I really help midlifers who, you know, that are feeling like they have a lot, they don't have any energy, they're swimming in brain fog. You know, they have all kinds of GI distress issues, you know, gas, bloating, indigestion, unreliable, unpredictable bowels, all those kind of things. Like I'm really focused on like getting their energy back, helping them have proper digestive function, which is huge, right? And have clear thinking without the use of medications. So that's really what my passion is about. Um, so that's why I really wanted to do this webinar on brain health because it is to me, critically important. And as we go through today and we go through this webinar and you hear some of these stats, um, I think you're going to clearly see why, you know, it's a, we're at epidemic. It's an epidemic. I mean, we really have to change the way that we're thinking about this. So at, for those who have joined me before, those that haven't, uh, we always got to start off with our housekeeping. <laughs> so let me get started here, which is all information contained herein within is for educational purposes only. Um, the information is not intended to replace medical care or diagnose, treat, prevent, mitigate, or cure disease. As always, consult with your health professional before attempting any self-health program. With that said, let's move on. So this month's master, master class is brain health. The brain is an organ, right, that acts as 
the main control center for our bodies. This complex organ controls things like intelligence, the senses, body movement, behavior. The brain weighs approximately three pounds and makes up about 2% of our body weight. Within the last 10 years, we have begun to understand more about the brain than we have in past centuries all combined, right? Like technology is really um, stepping up on how much that we're learning from science. And the brain can be divided into three sections, including the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Really easy to see where these parts are located, um, which is not always the case with the words that we find in science, right? So let's take a closer look at each section. This part I know is a little bit on the nerdy side, um, but stay with me, it'll make sense a little bit later when we look at some other pieces. So the three sections the brain can house in three different parts, right? We have the forebrain. So that's the largest, and most developed part of the human brain. And it houses the cerebrum. And then the midbrain houses the uppermost part of the brainstem. And then the hindbrain contains the upper part of the spinal cord. Also the brainstem and a tissue called cerebellum. The three primary parts of the brain are the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. So if we look at the cerebrum, right? The cerebrum is divided into four lobes. So we have the frontal, right? The parietal, the temporal, and the occipital. Um, the cerebrum is the largest part of the brain and is composed of the right, right? And left hemisphere. And the brain stem includes the midbrain, the prawns and the medulla. So the cerebral, I mean, I'm sorry, the cerebellum is located under the cerebrum. So between the cerebrum and the brainstem lie the thalamus and the hypothalamus. So the cerebral co cortex coats the surface of the cerebrum and the cerebellum. All right, so let's look at the forebrain, right? This whole section here, um, which is the cerebrum. The frontal lobe holds memories, okay? Which allows you to imagine, plan, and think. The parietal lobe translates the senses like touch, vision, hearing, as well as speech, reasoning, emotions, and is part of spatial orientation and navigation. The temporal lobe processes sound and language and houses the hippocampus and the amygdala, which plays roles in memory and emotions retrospectively. And the occipital lobe is responsible for visual processing and it allows you to recognize friends and read books. The midbrain, the brainstem, the brainstem re relays information between the brain and the rest of the body, right? The automatic features such as like breathing, heart rate, body temperature are all controlled in the brainstem. And then the hindbrain, the cerebellum, um, coordinates muscle movements, uh, motor control, uh, maintains posture, balance, things like that. The thalamus relays sensory and motor signals to the cortex and is involved in regulating consciousness, sleep, alertness. And the hypothalamus connects the nervous system to the endocrine system. Um, that's where hormones are produced um, via like the pituitary gland. And the cerebral cortex is, the mo is where most information is actually processed in the brain. So the brain is divided into two 
into and divided into two parts, right? We have the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, which is connected by a bunch of nerve fibers that are called the corpus um, colony, col, bleh, colony, some col, col, colosium. Oh, can't even get the words out. Theories uh, surround, you know, the left and right brain dominant stake on each side of control on different thinking styles. I'm sure we've all heard that before. Like I'm a right thinker, I'm a left thinker. Um, that that left and right brain theory actually um, originated with a Nobel Peace Prize winner, um, Roger Spry in 1981. So this information only came out in 1981. How about that? Uh, each sides of the brain control the opposite side of the body. For example, the left brain controls all the muscles on the right side of the body and vice versa. So let's take a look at the left brain, right? Left brain thinkers are said to be, we all have heard it before, logical, analytical, objective. Um, the traits of the left brain include things like language, logic, critical thinking, you know, numbers, reasoning, and let's give uh, the right brain a little time here as well, right? The right brain thinkers are said to be more intuitive, right? Thoughtful, subjective. Uh, traits of the right brain include, you know, include things like uh, facial recognition, emotional expression, music, reading, color, imagination, intuition, creativity, things like that. At the end, I'm gonna ask you all which one you are, if you're right or left brain thinker. Um, so why is the brain, why is brain health just so important? Um, besides all the things I said at the very beginning, right? Uh, a healthy brain functions quickly and automatically. And that's what we really want. A one in five people, one in five in the U.S. suffer from some form of neurological disorder, okay, which are diseases of the brain, the spine, and the nerves that connect them. The National Institute of Neurological Disorders report the following as common disorders. Neurogenic diseases like Huntington's or MS. Uh, developmental disorders like cerebral palsy. We have degenerated diseases of adult life like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, metabolic diseases like Gaucher disease, um, cerebrovascular diseases such as stroke or vascular dementia, trauma such as like spinal cord or head injuries, convulsive disorders like epilepsy, um, infectious diseases such as AIDS, dementia, brain tumors. So let's take a deeper look at a few neurological disorders. Dementia is considered a cerebro, uh, um, cere cerebrovascular disease, but it's not a specific disease, right? It's just a general term that is used to describe the decline of uh, mental ability. Dementia describes a wide range of symptoms. Um, for a condition to be considered dementia, so I want you all really to get this piece, um, at least two of the following must be significantly impaired. Okay, memory, communication and language, ability to focus and pay attention, reasoning and judgment, and visual perception. Okay, so if you're like, look, you know, if you have elderly parents and you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, does my parent have dementia? Like really think about those um, categories and see if they, if you can say yes to two of those, um, it might be time to get them checked out, right? Dementia is caused the brain cell damage that impairs communication um, in the brain and may cause short-term memory loss. Many forms of dementia are progressed, um, progressive, meaning symptoms actually get worse as time goes by. While there's no cure for dementia, some treatment options are available. 
a number of prevention strategies have been identified as helpful for reducing risk, right? That's what I try to do. That's what I try to teach. Um, we'll be discussing some of those in a little bit more detail as we go along. But some of the prevention strategies are things like looking at your cardiovascular risk, physical exercise, and diet. Let's look at Alzheimer's. That's one I know well. Um, it's a degenerated disease and most common form of dementia, causing problems with memory, thinking, and behavior. Over 6.2 million Americans, 65 and older, live with Alzheimer's. Okay, 6.2 million. One in nine people over the age of 65 has Alzheimer's. Early onset affects approximately 372,000 Americans under the age of 65. Minor changes in the brain occur long before symptoms show, okay? And if you've been to my website, I'm sure you see that's like the first thing I have posted out there is that we start developing these issues, right? 20, 30 years out before we ever get to a place where we have memory loss, right? Because this is a slow progressive disease. It really happens over time. Um, prevention factors, right? Things that we can look at is overconsumption of fat and carbohydrates are at the, at, are at the, the heart of this Alzheimer's epidemic, right? Uh, and that's my belief. Um, just so you kind of get this in perspective, uh, the risk of Alzheimer's is doubled if you have type 2 diabetes. And we know that type 2 diabetes is brought on by diet and lifestyle. So, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard this term before, but a lot of times Alzheimer's will be called diabetes 3 um, just because of the impact of that high glucose and those sugar spikes on the brain and how it damages the brain. Heart disease also increases your risk of dementia as um, arterial stiffness is associated with the buildup of amyloid plaque in your brain. And that's the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is right, the, amylo the amyloid plaque buildup. Um, I wanna talk about this just a little bit because I think there's a lot of misconception when it comes around amyloid plaque. And amyloid plaque is actually an antioxidant. It's there to protect your brain. So I always put out there like, why does it have to, right? What's going on in the brain that's making it produce more amyloid to actually try to help protect your brain? And as we go through, I'll be pulling out some ideas and thoughts behind that. Um, but one of the big ones for me is toxins in our food and surroundings, I think really impact our brain greatly. Next, we're going to talk about stroke, right? Stroke is considered an attack on the brain. A stroke occurs when there's like some kind of obstruction to blood flow in the brain, causing brain cells to die due to the lack of oxygen. The effects of a stroke are dependent on whether it hits the brain. Um, because one side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body, different functions may be impaired. So a stroke occurring on the right side may lead to things like paralysis on the left side or vision problems or quick inquisitive behavior style, memory loss, things like that. If you have a stroke and it affects the left side of the brain, um, you may see things like, of course, paralysis on the right side, right? Because it's the opposite, which we learned, you know, a few slides back. Uh, speech, language problems, slow, cautious behavior style, memory loss, things like that. Um, just to throw out some stroke facts for everyone, 
on, you know, some current information that I pulled up is that 800,000 new or reoccurring strokes happen annually. Um, up to 80% of strokes can be prevented. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the U.S. And stroke is the leading cause of adult disability in the U.S. As a parent or a grandparent, you always want what's best, you know, for your child or your grandchild. Um, and here are some suggestions that I pulled up from the neurological problem prevention form of energyconnectiontherapies.com. Um, and these aren't just great for kids, they're great for everyone. So really, you know, uh, listen to this, because I think there's some good information here. And the first topic we're gonna look at is nutrition. So provide, you know, let's look at like, let's get that local and organic produce, right? Because it really helps reduce our risk, you know, our intake of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. Um, I think it's really important for brain health. Um, ensure that your child or yourself, right, is drinking plenty of water. So that really helps your body eliminate toxins. Um, avoid heavily processed foods, you know, like tra uh, examples, trans fats, right? High sugar, artificial sweeteners are so damaging to the brain. So damaging. I can't stress that enough. Um, Toxin-free environment, you know, um, you know, try to utilize natural cleaners around the home as, you know, I, I really do some research there. I'm um, going to throw this out there. I don't know if any of you have ever been to this, but it's called Environmental Working Group. And their website is ewg.org. And I'll repeat that again, ewg.org. And if you go on there, you can actually look up cleaners. You can look up um, natural product. You can look up all kinds of personal care products. You can look up all kinds of stuff and you can really see how toxic it is because they do like a rating system. And I really suggest doing that. Um, avoid fabrics that have been treated with faint flame retardants. Uh, look for natural fiber furniture. And I can tell you that's a challenge. Um, we replaced our couch this past year and just to get something that wasn't made from synthetic fibers when we were looking and not having flame retardants or anything like that, any kind of chemical, uh, it took us a bit to find something. And something else I wanna throw out about um, toxin-free environment is really invest your dollars where you're gonna be spending a lot of time. And so I want you to think about that. For me, it was like, I need a good pillow. I need a toxin-free pillow. I need toxin-free sheets, right? This is a place where I spend a lot of time. I want a healthy, natural mattress, right? So as time comes up and it's time for us to replace these things, I want you to really think about like, where, where are you spending the majority of the time and where should you really invest your dollars to clean up? Another thing that... Um, can drive me like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs is those air fresheners. Um, you walk into someone's home and they got those Glade plugins. They are such a hormone disruptor. They can really increase our estrogens and they've been linked to breast cancer. Like let's get those things out. If it, if you can smell it, and it's not natural, it's a chemical concoction toxin, and it's really damaging to the brain. Get that stuff out, 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 out. I cannot stress it enough. Um, skin irritants, right? Uh, look at look for natural sunscreens and avoid to avoid exposure to chemicals. Uh, wow, that's that's a huge one. Uh, you would be shocked uh, on the sunscreens and how toxic. Um, Try cloth diapers to avoid exposure to chemicals used in disposable diapers to keep the wetness away. Dentistry, this is another really big piece. Um, look for a holistic dentist. 
avoid overuse of fluoride, fluoride known neurotoxin, avoid mercury containing fillings, you know, those silver, silver, silver fillings, you know, are full, have a lot of mercury and most people aren't even aware. If you do decide you want to get those out, please do in-depth research. Not everyone is capable of taking those out. You really want someone who has full-blown equipment because your olfactory nerve is right here and it goes right to the brain. Um, if you've ever gone on YouTube and looked at mercury and the brain, you can see if mercury crosses the blood-brain barrier, literally it takes your neurons and shrivels them right up. Um, instant death really, really um, a large problem. Healthy development, uh, in, you know, encourage physical activities, incorporate brain games. Uh, that's always a lot of fun. And limit your time on TV and computers, right? Like stimulate, do some stuff that stimulates you. There are a number of lifestyle habits that you can adopt that really helps uh, maintain brain health. Lifestyle can be broken down into the four into four categories. So I want you to really kind of just rate yourself where you are in these four categories. Physical um, health and exercise would be one, diet and nutrition, number two. Number three is cognitive activity. Uh, number four is social engagement. These categories have been shown to be reliable in keeping your body and your brain health to potential uh, reducing your risk of cognitive declines. So it's kind of good to know where we are with those. Research has found combining activities of each category has a great impact on maintaining or improving brain health um, than just doing like a single activity. We'll discuss ways to incorporate these categories into your lifestyle. Many studies have found an association between physical activity and the reduction of cognitive decline. Try engaging in regular physical activity and cardiovascular exercise to elevate your heart rate, right? We get that elevated blood flow that helps um, surge a lot of oxygen into the brain. That's great. Oxygen, the number one nutrient for the body. Uh, physical activities um, can both be mental and social engaging, right? Like take a walk with a friend, um, take a dance class, join an exercise group, go golfing, take tennis lessons, um, join a community pool, walk your dog, go for a bike ride, ride your bike to the bank. <laughs> Sometimes I do that. Oops, sorry, y'all. Getting ahead of myself. The World Health Organization recommends adults should do at least 150 minutes per week, which works out to be about two and a half hours. Sometimes I think when we see stats like this, it kind of overwhelms somebody if they're just getting started. So really, it's just about just getting started. You know, put in what you can put in. If you can get, you know, if you can get 30 minutes in and, you know, 30 minutes um, every other day, it doesn't even have to be 30 minutes all at one time. It could actually be like 10 minutes and then 10 minutes, 10 minutes, as long as you just get some movement in. It's real, you know, that's that's where we really see the benefits. Um, aerobic activities should be performed at least in like 10 minute sections. Uh, at least two days a week, try to work on muscle strengthening um, activities. Um, tips in incorporating physical activities, things like, you know, leisure time activities, you know, kind of pull it into your leisure time, right? Like walking or dancing or gardening, hiking, swimming, those kind of things. Transportation, like I already mentioned, like ride your bike to the bank, uh, you know, like walking or cycling. Household chores, they count, <laughs> believe it or not, they do because that's physical activity, especially if you're like vacuuming or uh, cleaning windows, dusting, things like that. Uh, believe it or not, old dogs can learn new tricks, right? Where I'm always learning. I'll, I'll be a lifetime learner. learner. I just love it. Um, continuing edu education during any stage of life will help reduce your risk of cognitive decline. And some great resources for that. Think about going to the library, community centers, rec centers, local colleges, 
uh, online. I know, uh, you know, for us here locally, you know, COA does a lot of adult continuing education classes. Um, you know, they can be a lot of fun. Um, the topics for learning, of course, are endless, right? Pick anything that interests you. Uh, look for a local class or check out a book from the library on that topic. I mean, that's, you know, really easy to do. Um, some fun ideas, you know, that you all might um, think is fun. I don't know. I think they would be fun is uh, check out like your local craft store or home improvement store for classes. A lot of them offer things that are going on. Um, look for books on cooking or making your own fermented vegetables. That's something we do a lot here at our house. Uh, teach yourself to sew or knit or crochet. Um, look for local church activity clubs or quilting is a popular um, in some areas. I've seen a lot of people that I know belong to quilter clubs. Gardening is another one. I know we have the Master Gardener program here and they're always looking for volunteers. Uh, join an online group such as Skillshare.com. And I'll repeat that again, Skillshare.com where you can pick up um, thousands of classes. I think currently they have something like over 19,000 different ones. Um, categories include uh, things like design, writing, technology, photography, um, you know, so many different ones to choose from if you're looking for something to try, something new. Um, there are many reasons to kick this habit, right? Smoking. Uh, smoking actually um, increases your risk of cognitive decline. Um, you, and I don't think a lot of people are really aware of that, but it, it absolutely does. Uh, here's some tips to, you know, throw it out there if anyone's still a smoker or trying to help you quit. Um, my first tip is, you know, find your reason, right? Maybe it's because you want to avoid cognitive decline. Whatever the reason, keep it clear in your mind um, and that will help motivate you. And I want everyone to, I want everyone to really be mindful of number one, because it doesn't matter if you're quitting smoking or if you're just trying to change some habit or implement some new things into your lifestyle. What I have found to be really true is that you have to define your why. Because when you get to a place where you're struggling, you're going to have to go back and look at that why. And that why will really keep you grounded. I find the why we do things is really, really important. Um, the second tip I've got is get prepared, right? Going cold turkey doesn't work um, for many. So choose some kind of method, you know, set up some kind of support system with a friend that to call if you're having trouble or you're fighting an urge, um, that, you know, that can, you know, having a buddy and accountability buddy is always a good idea. Uh, number three, replacement therapy, such as like, um, nickering gum or some kind of nicotine withdrawal, you know, to help you with it's something that will help with nicotine withdrawal symptoms is always a good idea Four finding new ways to reduce stress. Um, I think that's true for anybody who's trying to make a lifestyle change. I think it's when we are the most stressed is when we tend to like really fall back on old habits. Um, I think, you know, really looking at ways to control stress is a huge piece for that. Number five, avoid triggers in the first few weeks. Uh, if you associate smoking with drinking, then avoid drinking. If you usually smoke after a meal, then try taking a walk or doing something different. Um, the same is true for like any lifestyle um, adjustment. If you see that there's a pattern when you do these things, then it's better to not just pull that pattern out, is to replace it with something, right? So. Uh, example, let's say when you have a lot of stress, you tend to go for carbohydrates, right? You tend to go for food, then, you know, maybe you replace that with you're going for a walk or you're going to take a couple of deep breaths or whatever that is, but you, it's always good to replace it instead of leaving that area, you pull it out and then you just leave it blank. 
Um, I find people aren't very successful if they do that. It's better to have something that you can put into that spot to replace it. By taking care of your heart, your brain is more likely to follow. Studies have shown increased risk factors for cardiovascular disease and stroke, things like obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, negatively impacts your, cogn your, cog your, cogn ah, your cognitive health. Protect your brain by protecting your heart by maintaining your blood pressure, right? Your cholesterol, your blood sugar within recommended limits and sustain healthy weight. A healthy diet and regular exercise are key to you know, heart protection. So let's talk a little bit about cholesterol. Cholesterol is a waxy substance in the blood. Cholesterol is needed in the body to build cells and is the backbone of all your hormones. However, too much can be harmful. Cholesterol comes from animal-based foods such as meat and dairy. Uh, cholesterol is also made in the body by the liver. We tend to divide you know, cholesterol into two segments. Uh, one is the LDL, low density lipoprotein, which we all, you know, which we've all heard the bad um, because it contributes to fatty buildup in the arteries. And then we also have HDL, right? High density lipoprotein, which we all you know, is get dogged like good, right? Because it helps remove LDL. Um, check with your doctor on your optimal ranges uh, for your cholesterol. Another really big one is blood pressure. Blood pressure is recorded in two numbers, systolic and diastolic. So systolic blood pressure, that's that upper number, indicates how much pressure your blood is exerting against the wall of your arteries when your heart beats. And diastolic is the blood pressure, that lower number, right? Indicates how much pressure, once again, right? That your blood is exerting against the artery walls when your heart is resting. So typically systolic pressure or that top number is more important. Um, blood pressure is measured in MMHD, meaning that millimeters of mercury, which is a pressure gauge. So our normal levels or what we're shooting for is systolic to be less than 120 and the diastolic to be less than 80. Injuries to the brain can cause a risk of cognitive decline. It is important to take safety precautions when possible. So things like, you know, make sure you're wearing your seatbelt, use a helmet when you're riding a bike, um, take steps to prevent falls. Uh, common factors that contribute to falls are things like inactivity is the most common cause because it starts, we start to reduce our ability for balance, coordination, and flexibility. Um, things like trying yoga as a low impact activity can really help reduce those risks. Poor vision uh, can make tripping hazards or obstacles a little bit more difficult to see. Uh, some prescriptions and over-the-counter medications can actually cause dizziness or dehydration, which can actually contribute to falls. Uh, check your home and, uh, you know, check your your home environment, uh, simply simple modifications like, you know, making sure that if there's a, you know, your carpet's a little loose that you tack it back down so you're not going to trip it over. Uh, one thing that I feel like I do here in our household a lot is constantly moving the garden hose because the garden hose always seems to be across our walkway to go in and out of our house. Uh, when I was doing all my training with Dr. Amen, um, he really, really stressed this because uh, of so many brain injuries that he sees. And he basically stated that, like, if you're over the age of 40, you have absolutely no business being on a ladder. Uh, I remember him saying that over and over, you know, over 40, no ladders, no ladders, people.
Uh, you just make me laugh. Not enough, uh, getting, not getting enough sleep um, due to conditions like insomnia uh, may put you at risk for memory and thinking problems. When we sleep, that's when the brain actually cleanses and cleans. So if we're not getting proper sleep, we can bioaccumulate things in the brain and then that escalates that whole, you know, um, beta amyloid issue. Uh, insomnia can cause, um, can be caused by psychiatric or medical conditions. Unhealthy sleep habits are huge. Um, specific substances or certain biological factors can be a problem. Um, examples of medical conditions that can actually cause insomnia, things like nasal and sinus allergies, um, arthritis, asthma, chronic pain, lower back pain tends to be a large problem. Um, to get better night's sleep, you know, try creating um, a bedtime routine. Avoid using your computer and phone right before bed. Um, I always say this a lot. Please do not have your cell phone in your bedroom. Um, those, that Wi-Fi signal that it's pinging, even when it's, you know, even when it's not actually, you know, you're not actually using the phone. You know, those are EMFs. They cause a lot of issue with sleep. I've had people reach out to me and just simply by removing their cell phone out of their bedroom at night when they slept, totally changed their insomnia. So it's really worth a try. Um, I say that a lot, but that it's, it, you know, I think if we could actually see all the, all the EMFs that were all the Wi-Fi signals, we wouldn't even be able to see each other. And I think we would have, but because we can't see it, I don't think, you know, we don't really recognize that as being an issue. Try to incorporate maybe a few um, restful stretches, you know, before you get into bed. A warm bath or a hot shower can be really relaxing. Um, you know, using things, uh, I love lavender, you know, using lavender, Epsom salt, is also a really great one in a bath. Meditation can be really helpful. Try reading a book. That really helps calm the mind down. Avoid caffeinated beverages late in the day. So what I usually like to recommend is only having caffeinated beverages if you choose early in the morning, but definitely nothing after 1 p.m. Studies report an association between depression and an increased risk of Cognitive decline, managing stress can help reduce symptoms like depression, anxiety, other mental concerns. There are many techniques you can try for managing stress. Physical activity, you know, releases those feel-good endorphins. Taking deep breaths can actually lower cortisol levels. That helps lower our stress. Yoga combines movement and breath for potential stress reliever. You know, try relaxing forms such as restorative yoga. Meditation teaches mindful and can mindfulness and can have a really positive effect on mood. Um, guided visual, visual guided ones. I love guided meditations. You can find them all over Google. It's a really great way to start. Um, essential oils or aromatherapy um, can give you a really good boost, such a calming sense like lavender, bergamot, uh, frankincense, geranium. I personally love holy basil. Um, and journaling can actually be a really great way to have a release. Being socially engaged can help support brain function. Um, pursue, you know, like some social activities that are meaningful to you. Um, here's some ideas to get a little bit more um, social interaction, but find ways to be part of your local community. Um, volunteer at a library. Join a club to, you know, join a club to teach English or to read to children. See if a local park um, needs any gardening volunteers. Um, animal shelters, right? They're always looking for people to come um, and spend some time with the animals. Join a choir, um, maybe start a book club. Mental challenging activities are great for keeping your, mar your mind sharp, right? Challenge your mind may have short or long-term effects on your brain. So what you don't want to do, and what I mean by 
challenging your mind. It's not doing the same thing that you always do. Like, so if you've always done crossword puzzles or you've always done Sudoku or whatever it is, you need to pick something different because that's what challenges the brain. Once something becomes really repetitive for us, it no longer challenges the brain. So if it's like, you know, learning a new skill or working on a puzzle, um, participate in strategic games, you know, something like bridge, uh, learn how to play an instrument is really good because you have to do the fingers and all of that. Like there's, you know, you're using more than one piece. That's always a great um, aspect as well. Do something artistic like painting or scrapbooking, uh, read different books, um, journal, write poetry. Uh, one thing I suggest before, y'all might have heard this before, but, you know, even just using your opposite hand, like if you always brush your hair with your right hand, brush it with the left. Same thing with brushing your teeth. Anything that changes up your routine really will help the brain challenge. Nutrition, of course, is a huge part, right, of any health regime, including brain health, of course. Typically eating a well-balanced diet, which includes like a high intake of fruit and vegetables, low in fat and sugar can help reduce the risk of cognitive decline. Diets such as the, Mer the Mediterranean diet, we've all heard a lot about that. The DASH diet um, may actually um, contribute to like lowering risk of, you know, um, improve, improving your brain function. Yay, yay, yay. Uh, the Mediterranean diet is a heart healthy diet, which I'm sure we've all heard about this, which may also help protect the brain and incorporates different principles of healthy eating, which are typically found on the borders around the Mediterranean Sea. So things that we want to focus on are like fruits, vegetables, nuts, and grains. Um, replace butter with healthy fats such as olive oil. Reduce that red meat intake. Use herbs to flavor food rather than salt. That's a really big piece here. Um, eat fish at least two times a week. And DASH, I don't know how many are you familiar with DASH, but DASH is the dietary approach to stop hypertension. So we're going to eat foods that are low in saturated fat, total fat, and salt, of course. Eat more fruits and vegetables. Consume whole grains, poultry, fish, nuts, things like that, and limit your intake of fats, red meat, sweets, and sugary beverages. Some supplements that are associated with improving cognitive function on um, consuming a healthy diet is the best way to achieve optimal nutrition, but sometimes it can be really difficult, like getting all those nutrients that we need in one day. Uh, so try following the following supplements. Um, I really feel like help boost memory, motivation, creativity, alertness, general cognitive function. Uh, first on my list, I love fish oil um, containing healthy fatty acids, essential for maintaining the structure and the function of your brain. And on top of that, it's a, it has anti-inflammatory effects. So it actually lowers inflammation. So that's a really big plus um, for the fish oil. Resveratrol, uh, really potent um, antioxidant, right? Found in deep purple or red color fruits. Some studies have shown um, could actually prevent the deterioration of the hypo. Um, Campius, where memories are stored. So I always see a lot of people really um, adding a lot of those deep purple red color fruits into their diet as well. Ginkgo biloba, this herb supplement can increase the blood flow to the brain, therefore increasing brain power. We have ro rhodiola, rosea, which is a powerful supplement often used in Chinese medicine. Um, it helps promote like well-being and healthy brain function. And then fossil tidal serine, right? That's another great one. Um, it's a type of fat compound that is actually found in the brain. Some studies suggest taking fossil tidal serine supplements could be helpful for preserving brain health. 
I'll send, um, I will send all of you that signed up for the masterclass, a list of all these resources for you to be able to go check them out on your own. Um, so be on the lookout for this email. Once I get the webinar um, posted up on YouTube, I'll send all that out. So look for that. I want to thank, um, thank all of you for taking your time to join me today for our Brain Health Masterclass. Um, don't hesitate to ask questions once, once we open up the Q&A. Or you can email me if you prefer to do that at info at earlybirdwellness.com. Um, and that's B-Y-R-D. I'm always here to help you on your journey <clears throat> to make better brain health, of course. We are here to support you. So also, if you feel like you need support on this journey, don't hesitate to ask for help. Um, I love to offer you health strategy session as my gift to you, where we can carve out, you know, 30 to 60 minutes so I can learn more about what's going on with you and what support you need to get the results that you've been looking for. If you go to our website, you can easily book and choose the time and date that works best for you. I hope, um, we hope today that the Brain Health webinar gave you some great takeaways um, it, so you can start improving your brain health today. And what is next in our gifting back to our community health series? November, we will be doing um, a health email series on everyday mindfulness. Um, I have not put out anything on that yet this year. Um, because I do work in holistic nutrition, we look at the mind, body, and spirit. So that's going to be one of those soul spirit pieces. I think it's so important, um, especially for stress management. Can't stress that enough. Uh, doing something a little bit different in November because of the holiday. We're getting into Thanksgiving on November the 17th at 7.30 a.m., we are going to be doing a virtual coffee chat. So grab your coffee or your tea and join me on Zoom for open chat. So we're going to talk about like what's on your mind, make some social connections, just have a lot of fun. You guys can quiz me. You can ask me questions. If you know anybody that you think that would like to join our virtual chat, you know, it's not going to be like this. We're going to be full open screen. Everybody will be able to see everybody and chat. You don't want to, you don't want someone to see you. It's not a problem. You can always cut your video off um, and still participate. Uh, so stay on the lookout for all those invites. Um, I look forward to seeing you all in that group. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and let's go ahead and open up Q&A. So I'm curious, uh, what was your biggest takeaway from today? So if you go over, you'll see you should be able to unmute yourself. If not, I can help unmute you. Kate, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Anyone have any questions for me today or thoughts? Um, oh, can I be heard? Yes, of course. Oh, wow. This is still kind of new for me to even be on these things. It's so neat. Um, uh, thank you so much. I always um, find these, you know, so interesting. But one thing that did come up, um, and this is from something that someone else had shared also, when you speak of fish oil, um, cod liver oil, is that considered a good one? Cod liver? Cod liver oil, is that considered a good fish oil? Yes. What I would suggest um, for anyone who takes fish oil, if you're gonna um, purchase fish oil, then make, sh make sure that you reach out to the brand, the company, and ask them if they test for heavy metals. Okay. Okay. Um, I usually like to go with fish oil that are made from smaller fish um, than cod. I also make sure that whatever companies that I recommend, you know, the fish oil that I recommend to my clients, 
that the company can verify that it's been tested for heavy metals. Oh, good point. Um, one thing also, a great tip on the fish oil is if you have a fish oil um, and it comes in a capsule form, then you should prick it when you first get one in, store your fish oil always in the refrigerator, right? Because oils go rancid very easily. And the reason, and this is a great tip, take that fish oil, prick it uh, with some kind of pen and then put it on your tongue and it really shouldn't taste crazy fishy. If it tastes bad, then the oil is rancid and you're going to want to reach out to the company and have it replaced because fish oil, any of those oils, they can really go rancid really easily. So make sure that you store it as soon as you get that kind of stuff in that you always store it in the refrigerator. Any other questions or thoughts from today? It's Debbie. I just wanted to say thank you. This was very informative. I really appreciated it. And I really appreciate you pulling people together like this. It's very helpful. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I was glad you could join us today. Mm -hmm. Me and the puppies, they're both on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. And hi, Laura. <laughs> You're talking to me, Laura? This Laura? Yes. Hi, Laura. It's Debbie Rye. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to say thank you for this um, webinar. It was great. Um, I walked while I listened. So I got about 4,000 steps in as I'm a multitasker. Mm -hmm. And um, I also want to let you guys know that I probably will not see you on the call in November as I do. Only thing I do at 730 in the morning is check out the backs of my eyelids for holes. <laughs> yeah, so. I'm usually up fairly early. I know I was looking, I was thinking about, so, you know, just think about like, uh, if you want to send me an email or if anybody wants to talk about this, like what you would be interested in coming up like next year. Uh, Cause I was thinking about that. Not everybody is a morning person. So maybe if I do go to that kind of more open chat with, you know, like maybe, maybe just sharing, you know, like some little information, if it's, you know, kind of like what Kate brought up, right? Like if it's like how to pick good supplements or, or what to look for in a supplement, right? Um, Cause I look at people's supplements all the time and I'm like garbage, 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 you know, because I know exactly what to look for um, or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But like maybe going to that more open chat concept, um, we'll see how the coffee chat goes. Because I was thinking maybe one month I do the coffee chat and then the next month I do like, you know, the evening hangout, you know, because I can kind of alternate it between people that, or, or if it ends up being people do better in the, you know, early evening or evening, I could do that. Like I just got to figure that sweet spot that works for a lot of people. And I think the group chat is great because it's always wonderful when you're on a health journey to have other people who are on that same journey um, as support people. I know I have a walking partner and we walk every day. And when she's out of town, I still walk, but it does make walking a little more tedious in my mind because I'm not doing it with someone. So I, I recommend to everybody if they have someone that is either a walking partner or an exercise buddy that it does help to keep your accountability as to um, your plan. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I find that. I, yeah, I think that's true as well. I was going to also comment that um, when you asked about what we would want to know more about, you mentioned a food plan. Um, I'm doing okay, but I, you know, I'm still in the process of finding things out. So I'm maybe not quite ready for that, but I would be interested as more things are revealed uh, just to kind of help with grocery shopping, things like that. Um, and I do really am excited and appreciate that you're going to cover mindfulness um, next month. Um, I'm a big mindfulness person and, um, 
Um, and, and I also do creative um, visualization meditations. I do them myself. So I'm a really big believer in both of those things. I'm interested to see how, what you're gonna share with us and um, excited that you're sharing it with others as well. Yeah, the mindfulness will be an email series. So just look for that email invite. So, okay. and then it, um, cause, and then it just, it, it generates it out for you. And then you can just, you know, you just get little snippets, um, okay. you know, every other day usually is how I have them set up. So, okay. Well, um, if we have any more questions, feel free to ask. If not, then we'll just wrap, you will go ahead and wrap it up for this month's um, gifting back to the community. But thank you everyone for joining.